Uh, to kick us off, we have uh, Min Regan Kelly of IPython. Uh, I first ran into Min online through his, uh, his uh, IPython parallel tutorial, which is, I think, to date, the best tutorial and documentation I've ever read. Um, uh, <laughs> it was good, right? This is SciPy 2011, 2010? That's, that's funny, because I've been, I've been wanting to rewrite that from scratch for a long time. Right. Well, <laughs> that's uh, something about the state. And that is my plan for SciPy this year. That's so. awesome, yeah. Uh, Min also uh, uh, builds the Pi ZMQ bindings, uh, and he also has a, has a PhD in physics. Uh, so he's uh, pretty good at core infrastructure. So let's, give, let's, welcome, uh, let's welcome Min. Uh, All right, so I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here at PyData. PyData is always, is always fun, especially for those of us who work on IPython. Um, it's fun to see everybody doing new and, new and cool stuff with IPython. Um, yeah, I, I recently graduated in, in plasma physics, and now I get to, thanks to the Sloan Foundation, um, I, along with a few other folks, get to work on IPython full time, which is, which is pretty awesome. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what's what's new in IPython and recent release, and, and then what's coming kind of on the horizon for people to be excited about. So, um, at, on April first, we cut uh, IPython 2.0, the first major release uh, in six months, and there there are a few uh, major new features to improve the usability of, of the notebook. the The first piece of that is if you've used the notebook uh, in 1.0, one of the things that was kind of annoying is you had to start the notebook. Every, anytime you wanted to use notebooks in a different place, you had to start another notebook server um, in that directory and use uh, and open the notebooks there. Uh, so one thing that we have that we've added is simple directory navigation in the notebook dashboard. So this is my this is my notebook dashboard. In addition to the old notebook list, I have a list of folders that are just you know, folders on my machines. So I can navigate to my presentation, which is my PyData presentation. And then I can see the notebooks that I'm working on. In addition to this, now that you can navigate, it's easy to lose track of what notebooks are open, what kernels are running. So you have this running tab that shows you all the notebooks that you have currently running, and you can shut them down. So it's easier to clean up, clean up after yourself now that. So part of the goal of IPython is to kind of fill all the gaps that you need to restart the notebook server for. Ultimately, we really want there to only be um, one notebook server running, um, ultimately on a machine at all for all users. Um, but right now, we, we want to get to the point for one notebook server for, for one user and let it let that be uh, what you use for, for everything and not have to restart the, the server. So the, the kind of flagship feature of, of IPython 2 is these interactive widgets. And on Friday, uh, Brian and John gave a tutorial uh, illustrating some of, the, some of the use of interactive widgets and how you can use them for your own work. Um, and uh, Rob Story yesterday gave a great talk uh, showing various visualization things. And one of those was doing cool stuff with, uh, with the interactive widgets. Cool stuff, cooler stuff than I'm actually going to show you. but. Um, so the interactive widgets let you do things. Um, so in, in, in IPython, generally, you know, you run code, you get output. Here's a simple function that uses SymPy to factor uh, x to the n minus 1. Well, what if I want to factor that for various values of n? You just use this interact function. Um, and then I can interact with, fac with this factor it function for ver values of n between 2 and 40. So now that's x to 21, and I can just move this slider. And it calls that every time I, I change the value of n, it calls the function again. And then I get, I get the new display. So this is really useful for, say, you, know, you want to do some filtering on a signal or something like that, and you, and you don't necessarily know what parameters you want to use. This lets you really simply say, I, I know I want these parameters in some range. Let me just get it started and then tweak the sliders and, and see you know, what values I actually want to use. Interact also works as a decorator. So this is a function that, uh, that illustrates the, the beat frequency between two frequencies. So when you have two frequencies that are near each other, you get um, a, an associated frequency of the difference that you can hear, kind of a pulsing sound. So, and this is using the IPython HTML5 audio display. 
So I just take two, two frequencies, move these sliders, and then it publishes HTML5 audio after creating sine waves with NumPy. And we can hear, hear B frequency and change the frequencies. Get a slower B frequency. And we can also plot. We can actually see, see the frequencies being plotted and the beat frequency between them. That's updating much. And I can just turn, turn that plot on and off with a little checkbox. We've got lots of widgets. So this is a, a, a small sampling of the, of the widgets we have. So we've got checkboxes, we've got uh, toggle buttons, we've got regular clicky buttons. Um, we have sliders for, for floats and integers. We've got text input for, for floats and integers, great text input for texts, text areas for lots of text, radio buttons, all kinds of stuff. Basically, any, any of the, the basic HTML control elements, we've got a widget that maps that onto Python. And so here, I'm just going to create a sampling of widgets. And then I'm going to display them. And I've created this text widget here and hooked up a callback that in Python, when I move this, it, it changes a, a value. When it, so I move the slider in JavaScript, it changes a value in Python of an object. And I can hook up events for when that value changes, I can call this function. And the function I call just actually sets the value attribute of my text widget to a string based on what I just changed. But then when I change that Python value, it actually sends the data to JavaScript and updates the content of this text widget here. So I move the float slider, and it shows me what the float slider value is. Move the int slider, tells me what I'm moving. I can use a select widget to select things. I have radio buttons. I can type some text. And I can select the weather with toggle buttons. I like Unicode Snowman. That's the, some of the gist of, and that's also a good indication that our, at least Unicode isn't totally broken. Um, we still occasionally run into, run into Unicode issues, but I think we're doing pretty well at this point. Um, another major change in IPython 2 is, um, what's the time? Another major change in, in IPython 2 is the UI in the notebook uh, in terms of keyboard shortcuts and things has, has been rewritten substantially. Uh, the result is it is a, a modal UI, so there's a command mode and an edit mode. Um, and to help people get accustomed to this, we've added a, a tour using Bootstrap Tour for you know, kind of getting acquainted with the notebook. I can unhide my toolbar and go to the help menu. Check out user interface tour. So we're talking about we got the menu bar, we got the toolbar, so it doesn't always look right when it's all zoomed. Mode indicator. Normally there isn't something there, but I have uh, a, there, there's um, there's command mode and there's edit mode. And normally in command mode there there isn't an indicator for what mode you're in, um, but I use a, a fighter jet because of because it's fun. So now I'm in I'm in command mode. And then in edit mode, I get a little pencil. And you enter edit mode by pressing enter or clicking with your mouse. Hmm? Anyway. Yeah, and the tour kind of shows you how to do simple things. One of the nice things about the way we've rewritten it, um, in addition to fixing uh, various various bugs we had with the in interaction with jumping output and, and things is now it is a lot easier to customize the behavior of the notebook. So this is some JavaScript that is executing in the notebook. I'm, I tell the kernel to publish this JavaScript and then the front end actually executes this JavaScript in the page. And I'm going to, on this, I'm registering an event to log all the keys I press so you can see what I'm doing without looking at my keyboard. Um, and then I'm going to add, this is a, one of the common feature requests we get on IPython is, why isn't there a keyboard shortcut for run all? I want a keyboard shortcut for run all. And um, we've generally said, 
you know, no, we don't, we don't, we can't have a keyboard shortcut for everything, especially in um, 1.x because of the the way keyboard shortcuts work. There was a very limited um, space for for keyboard shortcuts, so we we couldn't have a keyboard shortcut for everything because it would uh, the the namespace for available shortcuts was uh, precious. And the great thing about uh, the custom keyboard shortcuts in 2.0 is we can say, no, we're not going to add a keyboard shortcut for run all, but you can. And so if you want a keyboard shortcut for run all, you just add a little code to your custom JavaScript, and then you can press Control R, and it'll run all your cells. And, and then we don't have to be precious about, um, about what shortcuts are available and collab fighting with the browser, because users can say, you know what, when I press this, I don't care about what my browser wants to do, what my OS wants to do, I, I just want, let me take this shortcut and, and use it to, to run cells. You can also change. There are, there are certain, certain, a certain class of users um, when switching between edit mode and command mode um, might prefer uh, slightly different shortcuts. And so you can change in, in IPython switching. So you enter edit mode by you know, selecting a cell, and you press enter. Um, and then to leave edit mode and go back to command mode with the shortcuts is you press escape. But some people would prefer, say, I to enter edit mode. And some people might prefer uh, control open bracket to uh, go, go back to command mode. So it's just a little bit of, uh, a little bit of JavaScript that you can ex that you can put in your custom JS file so that it runs every time on in, in every notebook that you run. Um, you can change, you can you can change shortcuts, you can remove shortcuts, you can add new shortcuts. So now, if you look up by by the little jet, you can see what keys I'm typing. So now I'm in, I clicked with my mouse. Now I'm in edit mode, control open bracket in command mode. I insert mode. I mean edit mode. So it's it's a lot easier to customize the the notebook UI, uh, which helps us at IPython a lot because now we don't need to argue about everything that's in IPython because we don't need IPython to be everything for everybody. We need IPython to at least be a decent starting point and then be able to point people in directions to customize IPython to suit their needs. With the increasing amount of JavaScript development in doing things with IPython, front-end uh, visualization with tools like MPLD3, um, and Vincent and Bokeh, you, you, increasingly you need to get JavaScript on the page, which means increasingly you need to install some JavaScript. You don't want to be loading everything from a CDN all the time. So in IPython 2, we've added a notion of notebook extensions. So if I just look at files, I've got this uh, just demo JavaScript file, which is a, a JavaScript file that um, is from my notebook extensions on GitHub, I can look at it's a. Uh, it looks like the the kind of the top of a a standard um, required JS loaded loaded file, and then we've added. Uh, make sure make sure it's not already there. So we've added this install nb extension entry point. So this file is just on disk, and I'm just calling out to the command line ipython install nb extension. And what that does is it copied the JavaScript file in the folder into this special NB extensions directory. So if you're familiar uh, with IPython, IPython has a notion of extensions, which are Python modules that you can add to extend the functionality of IPython. And they're just regular Python modules that define one function that, I, that when you load an extension, it imports that module and then calls that function. And that function can customize IPython behavior. This includes uh, things like the R magic or the um, the SQL magic, various things for extending uh, IPython's behavior. So we added a notion of JavaScript extensions for the notebook extensions that should modify that can modify IPython on the JavaScript side. So similarly, similar to the load extension uh, magic on the Python side, I can call. Uh, load extensions JavaScript function. This is again something you put in custom JS. So you install an extension; it's available to all your notebooks, but it's not 
loaded on all your notebooks. That's got to be something you do in notebooks or in profiles. And then if I put this in my custom Node.js or call it here, if you, if you look up in the corner, uh, note the absence of anything next to this, uh, this code select. Um, if I load this extension, I got a button. What does that button do? It looks like the standard share icon. If I hover, it says share notebook as a gist. I click it. Something may or may not happen. Yes, OK. It's always a risk. Um, and now I have this link. So I can click that link, which will take me to NB Viewer. So this is, now I'm at NB Viewer. This is a public uh, website for sharing notebooks. And now I have the notebook I'm currently working on published as a gist. So that's what, this is the kind of the category of things you can do with, with extensions. You can add buttons. You can do all kinds of um, customization of IPython. And ex ex yeah, so in installing extensions makes them available, and then you can load them with either with require. Um, so you can either you can you can use require to load uh, things like D3 or, or whatnot in, in the extensions directory, or you can use this load extension thing, which is basically just like a Python extension is import and then call a special function. The load extension in JavaScript is require and then call a special function. So the last bit is notebook security. So in the notebook, the notebook can have arbitrary code, or arbitrary JavaScript that JavaScript runs on the page, that JavaScript can run code, um, which means that JavaScript can call back to Python, and that then that Python can do you know, arbitrary things as you, like uh, rmrf slash, un unpleasant things. But also, those unsafe things are the entire point of IPython. Like, I IPython doesn't, the point of IPython is not to be safe, the point of IPython is just to make it easier for, for you to do all the things you normally do. So we don't want to cripple IPython, but what, what we really, what we, what we do want to do is avoid, um, we, where we have a problem is when you open a notebook that's creating a page with HTML and JavaScript, and that, that context has the ability to execute code. What we really don't want to do is if someone writes a notebook, says, hey, here's this cool notebook, and you open it, you haven't you haven't run any code. You just open it, and then it executes code. And all you did was look at it. You thought you were just looking at a thing, and then um, code executed that, that you, you didn't ask to happen. So we've added uh, a bit of uh, security to the notebook document. And that's we have this notion of trusted and untrusted HTML and JavaScript. And we never want to run untrusted we never want to load untrusted HTML onto the page, and we, we, we never want to execute untrusted JavaScript, which means that we sanitize HTML when we add it to the page and we, that we don't trust. And the gist of, of the model is, if you didn't ask for it to happen, then it's not trusted. So, and the way we communicate this is with uh, a signature uh, on the notebook document. So if I write a notebook and give it to you, it won't be trusted. But if you execute each cell, if you hit shift enter to execute the code, that HTML that comes back, that's trusted. You ask for that to happen, it's, it's on you if it does something uh, unsavory. Just like you know, running, running a Python script. Like you, you grab a Python script, you open it, it's safe to look at it. Once you trust it, you run it, it can, uh, at that point it can do whatever. And we, we want to get as close to that as we can. One of the trickier parts of this is we consider markdown, the markdown areas like this. We consider those untrusted, always. And that, that, uh, that does limit what, what can be done in the markdown cell at this point. We're, we're working on kind of what exactly our security model should, should do with that. And, and we, we handle all of the sanitization uh, with uh, the Google Kaha uh, JavaScript sanitization library. So what's coming in the future uh, for IPython? So first and foremost, um, starting a Python notebook with the pilot flag was, is, as, as of master, no longer works. And this is because there has been, well, this is because of a variety of reasons. Um, one, decoupling, loading a bunch of stuff. So PyLab loads a bunch of stuff into the interactive namespace. And that can cause a great deal of confusion for users 
because it matters how the notebook server was started, how, um, how the server was started can affect how notebooks behave. And that's a problem, especially when you're sharing notebooks or, you know, if I started the notebook with PyLab once and then I started a different notebook server without PyLab, I run one notebook from the other, or I, run, I, I run one notebook and then I run it later with different startup flags and it behaves totally differently. Um, so you think it's generally um, not a great idea to, to have that kind of thing at startup. But also, as we increase support for uh, non-Python kernels, adding, specifying flags for how the, the Python subprocess where execution happens um, makes less and less sense. So we're just, you only, specif you only configure the server at the IPython notebook command line and then you, any, any configuration of the kernel happens elsewhere. And part of that is, part of that effort is better support for non-Python kernels. Uh, so you, there already right now are several kernels uh, in, in various languages if you want to use the notebook, but you don't actually want to use Python, which may be a smaller fraction of this crowd, but um, you, can, you can use the IPython notebook with a variety of languages, and, but it's a, we're, we're, and we're working on improving that situation. So here's a Julia example. Simple Fibonacci, and then, as is always fun, this is using matplotlib from Julia to, to create a, an inline plot in the Python notebook. In 3.0, we're gonna be cleaning up a variety of things for making better uh, uh, non-Python kernel support. That includes cleaning up the message spec, uh, cleaning up the notebook format, and then better configuration for expressing uh, what associating a notebook with a kernel. Like you can say, this is a Julia notebook. When I open it, it should start a Julia kernel, not a Python kernel. And this is the start of, uh, the start of this spec is a simple JSON file saying how you start, you know, some, some metadata about the kernel. And then the important piece is how you actually start the kernel subprocess. We've got a bunch of changes to the message spec. We've, we've had, a lot of Python and IPython specific stuff we found in how front ends talk to kernels. And uh, Paul and Thomas from IPython talked about uh, how the message spec works yesterday, if you want to check that out. Um, and we're cleaning up a lot of the things that are IPython and Python specific to make it a bit more friendly to the, to the non-Python kernels. We're also going to update the notebook format. And we're going to, um, an important point of this, if you've been a long time user of IPython, um, we updated the notebook format once before, and that was a horribly painful experience. And we we're uh, going to work pretty hard to make it not so not so painful this time. Um, static widgets we're going to have uh, when you have a, a widget like this one. This is drawing a graph, you know, with various numbers of nodes, various levels of connectedness. Um, this doesn't work on NB Viewer uh, because the the widgets are purely transient. They're not stored in the notebook file. They're not stored anywhere. They're they're purely interactive. So we're going to add some, some amount of persistence, both uh, simple persistence for loading, for when you open a notebook, you get a widget, um, and then also caching all the various states of the widgets and their output so that you can actually interact without a kernel. So on NB Viewer, you just have static HTML. Um, moving these sliders normally call Python code in the back end, but the results are known. So if you just did a sweep and then remembered all those outputs, you could save them somewhere and then you could have a static HTML with all the cached states, and then you could still have those sliders without actually running any code and get all that output back. And then the big piece is the multi-user server. So we're, you know, we've been polishing the single user notebook experience for, uh, for a couple of years now. I think we're doing pretty well. Um, and adding multi-language support is kind of the last big piece of that. And the next step is, all right, so we've got, we're getting pretty close to being able to run one notebook server per user for on that machine. Um, the next step is, all right, we want to run one um, for, for the use case of, say, a classroom or a research group. You have, you know, you start up as the admin, you start up a notebook, uh, a notebook server, and then users log in with their regular Unix credentials, and then that spawns uh, subprocesses so that the, the users get access to their whole shell and, and notebook and everything. Um, and that just, they just hit, hit one web page, log in, it starts the sub processes, and then you have, 
your notebooks and kernels uh, without all your users having to um, you know, SSH and then start the notebook with no browser background screen and all that. Um, you can just, with you know, upstart or, or whatever, you just start up one daemon process that will be in charge of dispatching and proxying um, the kernels. An important uh, point of this is that it is not um, part of our plan to build a, a multi-user server for untrusted users or lots and lots of users. You know, we just want to cover kind of the basic case of a design of having multiple users. It starts, you know, you're on a shared system. Uh, you have trusted users that once they're logged in as them, they should be able to do anything they can do as them. That it is, it is kind of up to Linux to, to decide what they're allowed to do. And the next big step that we have that we have on the horizon, once we've got, so we've got we're polishing the single user experience, and then we finish with the, you know, we start getting multi-user going. Once you've got multiple users, those users want to work on the same notebook at the same time. And so that's kind of the next, just over the horizon, um, the next big plan for the hard project for us to work on is live collaboration in the notebook. And then I'm just gonna spend my last couple minutes talking about working on IPython. So IPython is uh, started long ago by Fernando as an afternoon hack working on, well, working on his PhD. Uh, and as of January of last year, um, we have funding for six full-time people to work on, work on IPython, which includes, how many of us are here, five? Yeah, everybody but Fernando who's funded. <laughs> is here. <laughs> um, Fernando is on a plane from England right now, I think, at this very moment. So just looking at a few, some, some Git data about recent history of IPython. So this is just looking at summarizing uh, recent releases. So 0 0.11 was the first kind of um, partially funded uh, release of IPython, where Brian was funded by Nthought to kind of to refactor, to clean up a lot of the afternoon hacky bits of, of IPython and allow and set the, the groundwork for this multi-process architecture that is the, uh, underlies the notebook. And since then, um, and then in 2013, which was halfway between 0.13 oh, and 1.0, we started uh, actually having funding for the first time for multiple developers um, to work. And our, since then, uh, in 2.0, which is a six month release, our kind of rate of work has, uh, well, rate of work. We've, we, we, we do get a lot more work done now that we're funded, is, is kind of the gist. <laughs> That's, so thanks to the Sloan Foundation for actually helping us get work done. But a, a challenge, uh, when you have funded developers, and, but you have a small number of funded developers who have a lot of work they want to do, and you get a popular project with a lot of people want to use it and a lot of people want to help out, um, is, you know, we still have all these contributions that are coming from volunteers, and volunteers don't have as much time as funded developers. So, you know, you, you get someone who, you get people who open, open pull requests and are like, that's, it's, it's so great that you're, uh, you want to help out, it's, the contribution is, is really helpful, but we have all these plans that actually conflict with that, um, in, that we, actually, we haven't gotten around to, right? So we've, we've got these big plans, we've got developers who have time to work, but we don't actually have that many, so we don't actually have that much time to work. So we, have, we end up with these conflicts of someone wants to fix something, but we actually plan to totally change how that works. And it's, it's been a challenge, to actually figure out how we deal with uh, contributions when we have, you know, we have this time to work on things and we have big plans. Um, and so you just want to make sure, you know, visualize pull requests. These are pull requests on GitHub that have actually been merged. So this is funding starts right here. And um, after a bit of ramp up in the spring, the, the pull request from, from core devs, from funded people, um, has dramatically increased, and the contribution, the actual successful contribution rate from the community is, is roughly, uh, roughly stable. And the 
So the, the fraction of pull requests was from community members was roughly half, but the as core dev development, core dev work has dramatically increased and uh, community development has roughly stayed flat, um, the, the fraction from the community is, has dropped a little bit. So I'm actually, um, yeah, I talked about, about communication balance, but I only, I'll leave the last five minutes for questions. So I'll, I'll stop here, but yeah. The last, last little bit is the dream for the future of IPython. So IPython is a growing number of things for working, for doing interactive work. Um, it makes sense at this point that it's all one big project because every up, so far every update would be a breaking change that would, we would need to release every piece of IPython. If IPython were several, pro several projects, we would need to release them all at once because they're not um, intercompatible um, with, you know, we, we, we make these in, internal private API changes um, every release. And so it, it, w it doesn't make sense at this point to, um, to break up IPython as we're still, since we're still figuring out so much. But we're, we're getting closer to kind of understanding the, the boundaries between these pieces. And once those stabilize a bit, kind of the, the real dream in IPython is actually to break it up into several, several projects that just talk to each other over the message protocol. Um, you know, the IPython kernel becomes just another kernel um, just like the R kernel, the Julia kernel, um, and break off, you know, the Qt console is its own project, um, I, IPython parallel is its own project. And so that is, if we are successful in stabilizing APIs, you, the one way to know if IPython has been really successful is if it, it um, explodes into, into a few separate, separate repositories in the next few years. Yeah, I think I'll stop there. Any questions? So if someone wanted to contribute to IPython, what is the best method that they should use? The best method, um, the best method to use for contributing to IPython is to look at open issues um, and find, so we, we mark some bugs as like quick fix or um, that are, or sprint friendly. Those are, those are things yeah, we, we have labels on issues that are kind of meant to be smallish, easy things to fix that, fix that don't need to touch all kinds of stuff. And so that's, look through some of those issues. Actually, a really helpful way, so we've got, you know, these almost 800 issues, is to look at issues and, and see, do they, are they still actually true? Does, does this, have we fixed this issue? Um, and, you know, ping, you know, look for, write test cases, uh, regression tests, you know, find an issue, actually write a test so that it's easier to know whether a bug's been fixed. If it has been fixed, just make a PR with the test and close that issue. You know, the, one of the challenges with having lots of, lots of open issues is we don't, always, we don't always link up bug fixes to the issues that they actually fix. So there, there are probably, of, of the, I think, 750, 780 uh, currently open issues, I would say there's probably at least one or 200 that should be just closed right now. And we, we just don't know what they are. I'll take, okay, good. Um, I'm really interested in IPython Parallel. Can you talk a little bit about the sort of, I've heard in the ether that like 100 a hundred kernels is all that is advisable. Does yeah. that mean a hundred independent servers, or if I've got two really big servers with like sixty-four cores each, is that more stable? So it depends. It depends on. Um, so the issue. There are a couple of issues. So I have. So IPython parallel is mostly my work. That's that was my the first IPython parallel was my undergrad thesis at Santa Clara, um, and then I rewrote it to use ZeroMQ while I was working on ZeroMQ, um, and. Right now, because of some architectural uh, choices, the limit of good scaling is probably one to three, depending on the nature of the, of the work you want to run, one to 300 uh, IPython engines, which are IPython processes. And the number of those that's appropriate depends on what work you want to do. So if, if your work is, um, you know, nice, uh, 
you know, C-level multi-threaded um, array operations, you might want one IPython engine per uh, physical CPU with, you know, 16 cores or something. And the, the scaling uh, limit is affected by the number of IPython engines. So it depends on the nature of your, of your individual uh, tasks that you want to do in IPython parallel. So if it's all like Gil holding effectively single threaded, then you generally want one engine per, uh, per core. Um, or even if it's IO bound, maybe one and a half engines per core. Um, but if you've got good um, multi-threaded uh, extension code, maybe you want you know, one per chip or one per physical machine. It, so um, can you talk a little bit about the memory creep issue and, and dying processes if you, if you launch 100 kernels and one dies, does it respawn? If, if it stays open for a bunch, bunch of tasks, does it kill itself and, and release the memory? So you can, IPython doesn't handle that. Uh, it, so the cluster behaves fine if an engine dies. So you can, you can add and remove engines at any point, and the, the IPython parallel architecture handles that just fine. Um, what it doesn't do is, um, so IP engine just starts a process listens for messages and handles them. If you start IP engine with supervisor or something, you can make it kill it if it gets too big and respawn when it dies. You, so um, IPython doesn't do that for you, but you can easily enough do that with IPython. Great. Um, we need to wrap up now for the next talk. Can everybody give Min a huge hand? Um, give us a couple minutes and we'll have the next speaker up.